cooperation and development. And we are very proud to be partnering again with our partners from the Munich Security Conference to bring that special format to Munich. Uh, we are very happy that so many of you are interested in this conversation. And I hope that you will be able to join us over the next days while we are having excellent discussions here, panelists from all over the world, broadening a little bit, I would say, the scope of the discussion here in Munich with the unique town hall format. And it gives me uh, a great satisfaction that we can open, officially open this town hall format with such a great panel and such an important issue. So I don't want to take the position of our panelists, but just want to say that the German development cooperation with our partners around the world, we are confronted with unique challenges. If you just look at where we are today in the implementation of the SDG agenda, experts are talking about a financial gap of four trillion US dollars. So for us, it comes naturally that we don't believe that we can do the trick with less official development assistance. But we also believe that the contrary logic would also not apply. Even if we would have more resources on official development assistance, we would not be able to face the challenges. So what we have been doing, and the German government, I'm happy that Minister Lindner is here, making a strong push for World Bank reform, bringing the multilateral development banks to where they need to be to face the challenge. We need to talk about innovative instruments of financing. What we are going to do and what we started in the last couple of years and months. So I think we have an excellent panel, Prime Minister, Ministers. Uh, we are very happy to have you. I wish you and us a great discussion. And with that, again, warm welcome to that special town hall, town hall format of the Munich Security Conference and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm Zanny minton Beddoes from The Economist. Uh, good morning. I'm delighted to be moderating this opening panel. Uh, I love the title, World Politics on a Budget. <laughs> so it is uh, indeed we are on a budget. Governments are under increasing pressure, both in the advanced world and in the emerging world. But the pressure on spending is also growing. Um, I think here in Europe, we are feeling right now that we are in a considerably more dangerous world. Um, in light of the remarks of Donald Trump, the former president, an even more dangerous world than we thought. Uh, so I think there is a pressure to increase defense spending um, and a big question about where that money comes from. At the same time, there is an enormous uh, requirement to finance the climate transition, both in advanced economies but also in emerging economies, and a question of debt sustainability, um, and of course, the investments needed to meet the SDG goals. So a lot of pressures on a pretty tight budget. We could not have a better panel to discuss this. Um, this is really an extraordinary panel of, of practitioners and thinkers. Uh, to my left, to your right, um, Kyrgios Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of Greece, um, a man who has actually put Greece's uh, fiscal house in order, but perhaps more importantly, and I think this morning deserves a special round of applause, has just pushed through the legalization of same-sex marriage in Greece, which I have to say is an extraordinary step. So I would like to start with that. Um, over there, Christian Lindner, Minister of Finance of Germany, needs no introduction in this audience. Uh, Diana Mondino, on my right, your left, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the new government in Argentina. Congratulations and welcome. And John Studinsky, Managing Director and Vice Chair of PIMCO, which um, crudely put finances a large amount of governments. Um, essentially huge number of, of assets under management. And we will be joined a little later by Vera Songwe, who is the chair and founder of the Liquidity and Sustainability Facility and co-chair of the independent high-level expert group on finance for climate action. So Vera will be able to give us that perspective. Um, Minister, uh, Prime Minister, let me start with you, actually. Um, uh, so first of all, congratulations, but on, on really what is a historic um, passage. But let's talk about more sober things, um, fiscal houses in this time of increased spending. Um, Greece is pretty unusual. You've, you've now got a much, much, much better fiscal position, and you spend, correct me if I'm wrong, 3.5% of GDP on defense, which is a heck of a lot more relative to the size of your economy than most countries in NATO. Um, how do you do it? What's the secret? What advice can you give others? Ah, and welcome. Thank, I'm, I'm sorry I introduced you earlier, Vera Songwe, but very, very nice to see you. 
Thank you. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Jenny, for your kind words regarding uh, the legislation on uh, uh, marriage uh, equality. I'm here with a few hours of sleep, and I think it's a uh, milestone decision for my country, and very proud to be able to introduce it as a leader of a center-right government. Now, um, coming back to your um, uh, question, when I look at many European countries and I observe their fiscal position over the past uh, 30 years, I, I think a lot about the fact that Greece never really had a peace dividend uh, in the sense that we were constantly faced with geopolitical threats in our neighborhood. And even during the very difficult years, we were always spending more than 2% uh, uh, of our budget, uh, uh, of, our, of our GDP on, uh, on defense. Uh, so in, in our case, it didn't really take a lot to uh, increase uh, our ability to finance our defense spending because we faced very particular geopolitical challenges uh, which uh, maybe uh, other European countries clearly after the collapse uh, of, uh, uh, of the Berlin Wall didn't feel the need to spend that much um, uh, on defense. But to, to the point of this debate, can you do foreign policy uh, on a budget? The simple answer for me is, is no. And we will all need to be able to spend uh, uh, more uh, on defense, but also be much smarter in terms of uh, how we allocate uh, funds to defense. I was uh, reading an article by the president of the commission, or an interview actually she gave uh, to you, um, and uh, she was um, uh, very clear about uh, the necessity to mobilize more funds, both at the national but also uh, at the European level, which is going to be a challenge at a time when our budgets are under pressure because we also need to finance uh, the climate transition and the technological transition. We're faced with higher interest rates. Uh, and uh, we're coming out of uh, COVID. We had to spend much more um, uh, to recover from, uh, from the pandemic. Uh, so at the end of the day, Greece has been able to achieve um, what you described uh, as uh, a situation where we can spend more on defense while bringing down our debt to GDP ratio simply because our economy has been growing much faster than the Eurozone average. At the end of the day, if the economy doesn't grow, you will not have the necessary funds to finance uh, either defense yeah. uh, or climate. So underlying growth and competitiveness of our economies, in my mind, is absolutely, absolutely critical. True for Greece, I think true for Germany, true um, uh, for, uh, for all European countries. We have been constantly overshooting our fiscal targets, uh, uh, and uh, this, this growth has been uh, able to, to allow us to do more, not just on defense, but also uh, on social policy. Now, when we look at uh, uh, the, the European uh, scene, I think uh, one of the challenges for uh, the next European cycle is how do we do more uh, on defense? Does this mean more um, um, fiscal capacity uh, at the European level? Does this mean uh, giving the EIB a mandate to finance more defense-related projects, which may be longer term, and involve a higher risk. What it certainly means, uh, and I'm speaking from the perspective of, uh, of a defense buyer, is a clear streamlining uh, of the European defense uh, industry, which is currently incredibly fragmented. For example, when we sort of are looking to purchase you know, sort of a new ship, a new frigate, or a new corvette, we're faced with five or six different offers from different European countries, different European shipyards. That doesn't make much sense. We need to agree which are the the projects where we need to pool resources uh, and where we need, uh, where we can actually be competitive, also vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. If you look at fighter planes, do we really have a plane now that can compete with a fifth-generation um, U.S.-made fighter? The answer is probably not. So at some point, we also need to take some strategic decisions. Where do we pool our resources? And this will allow us actually to purchase European. One final point, very important that uh, uh, in the new uh, fiscal rules, we agreed um, uh, to treat defense spending in a slightly different way. In other words, under certain circumstances, um, defense spending will not count towards the excessive um, uh, budget uh, calculations. This is something we insisted on, and this also makes the case that re when we look at all the spending portfolio, defense, because of its critical importance, is something different. Uh, and, uh, 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 and something which is existential and, and that important to be also treated differently from an accounting point of view. So I think this is also uh, an important step uh, in, um, in, in the right direction. Hopefully we won't be able to, to, to use these exceptions, but it's good to know 
uh, that this possibility actually exists. Just, you, you mentioned the need for streamlining and that there were, you know, procurement pr processes were far too complicated and there were too many, too many providers. One of the things that Ursula von der Leyen said in her interview, and I, it was to the FT, not to us, but she, I, underst I understood her to say that you needed to look perhaps at the model of COVID financing and what the European Commission had done there. Do you think there is a role for joint financing on defense? Do you think, how far do you think the Europeanization of defense should go? Ah, well, this is probably um, a question you should also I will, ask, but uh, I'm asking you for her. <laughs> to, my, to my dear <laughs> friend, the Minister uh, of Finance. Look, what we did after COVID was incredibly important. Uh, and I remember my discussions with Angela Merkel at the time. She was very skeptical uh, at the beginning, but I think we managed to convince her. And the next generation EU is, in my mind, a milestone European project and we're using these funds to drive the green transition, to drive the digital transition, to make our economies more competitive. Uh, and of course I understand the skepticism by you know, the more frugal um, countries, how do you actually use the European funds, but at the end of the day, if we make a good case out of the next generation EU, I think we will have a convincing argument to be able to not necessarily create a new next generation EU, but to contemplate in a more convincing manner what does it mean to actually uh, create more more resources, more own resources uh, at the European level. Minister Lindner, let me turn to you. Um, you wrote a very interesting article in the Frankfurt Allgemeine this week where you said we had to go, you know, we moved away from a world of uh, the, the peace dividend to one of a Freiheitsinvestition, investment in freedom. Um, can you elaborate on that a bit and what does it precisely mean in terms of how much defense spending in Germany needs to increase, how it's sustained, and how do you pay for it? Uh, let me start uh, briefly with the, the European uh, perspective, and uh, then I will uh, come to the uh, domestic uh, German uh, policies. Mm. I think in, in Brussels, it is, uh, it's kind of a sport uh, to uh, look for problems to present always the same solution, mutualized debt. <laughs> and this is why I think the uh, defense agenda of the um, European Union should focus on uh, different topics. For example, we need a single market for defense goods, probably a consolidation of the defense industry in the European Union. Um, uh, second, the framework conditions to uh, expand the production uh, capacity of the defense industry have to be uh, improved. I completely agree with what the Prime Minister has said about the uh, European Investment Bank and their capacities to invest in uh, defense, private sector pre uh, defense projects. I think we have to reconsider the idea of um, a social taxonomy which could limit private sector investments in the defense industry. I'm open for, for uh, joint uh, procurement of uh, defense uh, goods. I think this is an agenda for the European Union, not the mutualization of debt and common funds for the uh, national defense initiatives. This would cause problems between the European Union and uh, 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 NATO members, uh, as you are um, probably aware of, uh, not all members of the European Union are members of NATO, and so uh, both um, have uh, different uh, priorities. Talking about the German um, situation for the uh, first time um, since many, many years, uh, Germany will um, spend more than 2% of our GDP uh, on defense uh, this year. We uh, finance this with an uh, extra budget um, next to our annual budget, uh, Sondervermögen uh, für die Bundeswehr is the, is the name. Um, this will allow us uh, a period um, up to 2028 to meet the 2% targets. Afterwards, we will have to find different solutions. And it is key what uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis said, we have to, to establish a growth agenda. It will be easier uh, to shift the priorities within the budget if we have more prosperity. 
And so it is key that the, the competitiveness of Germany and the European Union, the European Union as a whole uh, will be uh, improved. What I've um, uh, meant with uh, Freiheitsinvestition is the following. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, we thought that we won't ever need to defend European territory again. And so the focus uh, in our defense expenditures were to, to um, uh, take responsibility globally, but the uh, um, capabilities to defend our territory, these capabilities were reduced. And um, the fiscal space was used to, to expand the welfare state. And this process, we have to turn around. Now, the defense expenditures over the next year will have uh, to be higher and higher step by step. And uh, if we have uh, prosperity in the economy, we will be able to finance this. Can, can I push you a little bit on whether the goal of reaching 2% by 2028 yeah. is actually enough in light of the concerns we now have about the US, in light of the possibility of a Trump administration, in light of what you yourself wrote? Firstly, should Germany be doing more? Is it enough to be spending 2% of GDP on defense in the world we're in in Europe? And if, it, if it's not enough, what is going to be needed to make this sustainable? Because this was a one-off, I mean, it's a multi-year, yeah. but it's a one-off approach you've got right now. Well, given the size of the German economy, 2% is uh, much. Uh, if it is uh, sufficient and uh, if it's enough, we will have to decide uh, over the next years. But uh, maintaining a level of 2% uh, defense expenditures is already a challenge. And so if we will be able uh, to maintain this level, I, as finance minister, um, I will be very pleased and grateful um, for the German public to support this. And, and what will, I mean, growth, is, growth will get you a long way, as Greece has shown, but you, is there also going to have to be some thinking about cutting back on other priorities in the budget? Well, this is, um, this is a challenge because um, um, the, the, um, the threat for European um, security is very concrete in the case of Ukraine, but uh, maybe in some years people will think it is an abstract uh, threat. And so we have to maintain the, the support for these defense investments and expenditures. There will be campaigns in the future, I predict, in, in which politicians will ask people, okay, whether they want to, to improve the pension system for elderly people or spend more on defense. And so um, this is the, the political challenge to keep the support for uh, reasonable uh, defense uh, expenditures high in our societies. And this is why I'm advocating for a strong economy. It will be easier uh, to um, uh, spend more if uh, the economy itself is growing. And um, having said this, about the 2%, um, we, have, we do not only spend less than the US, I think, I think we are um, furthermore less efficient. So um, one of the, the processes we have to, to develop is in which way will we be able to get more for every euro we spend on defense? And this leads to a single market and a consolidation for uh, the defense industry. I'm going to turn in a second to the other big demands on the state, which are in the emerging world. But first, John, I wanted to get your perspective from the private markets of what you've just heard. If, if there is going to be um, a requirement for substantial increase in defense spending in a continent in Europe that is already pretty, has already got pretty serious deficits and debts, um, what is your sense of how that can and should be financed? Markets have shown, I think, in the last three years with the advent of artificial intelligence, all the businesses that follow artificial intelligence, 
like power, for example, data centers, and all the related industries, that investors want something, and I refer to it as a secular investment. Secular investments are investments that where there's a substantial change in society over a three, five, eight, ten year period where there's going to be a constant demand and need for capital in the long term. There's no question there can be more public-private partnerships between the private sector, whether it's defense, uh, climate green industries, and or infrastructure. The power generation area and needing to rethink, for example, mobile nuclear, very important. All these data centers that fund artificial intelligence will need mobile nuclear. And if you just look at the last two years and how the markets have responded, um, no one in this room two years ago will have heard of NVIDIA. We all now know it's one of the largest market cap plays in the world. So you apply that to the issue of defense. And it's interesting because the whole area of defense, like the whole area of ESG, means different things to different people. It's a very polarizing subject. But there's no question that since the advent of, of the two wars now, there are many more institutional investors <coughs> that will allocate substantial money to defense because they see it as essential towards a stable economic world order. So opportunities of, I mean, we heard last night uh, a fabulous discussion about all the entrepreneurs focusing on mobile drone technology. There's a lot of opportunities there for public-private partnerships. Uh, this all doesn't have to be financed by European companies, countries. It has to be partnerships, where you can bring the urgency of the private sector in terms of data, details, and deadlines, because governments are not good at managing deadlines, as we know. The private sector is, uh, and we saw that during COVID. Uh, private sector is much better at it than the government sector, coupled with the urgency that a lot of governments have right now, given a lot of the security uh, threats. We are now living in an age, I think, of um, authoritarian personalities, where the whole challenge of democracy and the need for defense is going to get into True, a but a very different subject. No, but that's going to push the area of thinking about defense in a very different, very different way. Prime Minister, yeah. Quick comment based on, on what you said. When we look at the way our defense departments make procurement decisions, they're really not at all thinking about the changing nature of warfare. So it's long-term projects, you know, big ships, you know, big plane purchases. Um, um, uh, but we need to make sure that uh, our uh, departments, defense and finance, are ready to take into account the changing nature of warfare and incorporate new technologies which may be much cheaper, much more innovative, mm. much easier to deploy. And this requires a different mindset mm. when it comes to very sort of traditional um, um, uh, public departments that have been trained to think only um, uh, uh, in one particular way. I would like to briefly add exactly uh, the idea of procurement has to be changed. We need to buy what the markets offer, but our defense agencies and ministries too often want tailor-made technology for them. And this is expensive and needs too much time. So this is a perfect segue to the second half of our conversation, because I think actually there is a, there is a fault line running through this, which is the need for innovation in financing and the need for innovation in thinking. Because the other big pressure on budgets around the world is, and particularly in the emerging world, is the pressure of financing the climate transition. And it's also the pressure of ensuring debt sustainability. Um, and Minister Mondino, you uh, are part of a government that is pushing through extremely bold steps to try and deal with Argentina's pretty parlous debt situation. Uh, from your perspective, when you listen to this discussion, and I think this echoes what is you know, going on in many corridors in the advanced world, which is we need to worry about the kind of financing requirements of a more dangerous world, you have an immediate challenge, debt sustainability. You have a longer term challenge, which is how do you secure sustainable financing in this world? How do you think about it? 
Well, actually, uh, same as he was saying that uh, the peace dividend was not really generous with, with Greece. Actually, we have squandered, technically dilapidated, our demographic dividend. We have a lot of young population, and a lot of older, the younger population is uneducated right now in Argentina or serious problems as regards to nutrition, etc. And we still have a retirement project. That's the, one of the reasons why Argentina incurred in debt rather than having infrastructure projects, etc. Argentina incurred in debt uh, just for current expenditure. Now this government, we've only been 70 days in, less than 70 days in government, we are trying to shift completely the approach and having to concentrate in giving the most opportunities to the younger people so that eventually they can become part of the workforce and at the same time con con uh, reducing our public expenditure. And you say, how come you're going to spend so much more on the social area and so much less as that you get into, um, you get rid of these budget constraints. Um, mind you, for the people that are in the room that may not know, when the government took office, again, 70 days ago, our total fiscal deficit on GDP was 15%. 15%. Mm -hmm. 15% on a total government expenditure from the, at the federal level of 23. So that's, I mean, we need to take away, it looks like we have to take away half of the expenditure. Of course, that's not the case. It depends how you do it because we have, we're going to make the economy grow when we take away most of the expenditure that are a burden on the private sector. So we are getting a mixture of a, trying to have the economy grow and at the same time helping in, on the very important area that in the long term, our debt sustainability will not depend on our finances, but it will depend on a much better workforce and that's why our social expenditure has to go that way. It's very different, different than spending on defense. It is different than spending on defense, but it is a different, it's a similar change of mindset and you are, you are pushing through some very radical reforms at home. Yes. I wondered whether you had had time to reflect on whether the international financial architecture, which has, you know, frankly allowed you to, ha allowed your country to have this extraordinary debt problem, yes. is actually fit for service for the kind of world that we're talking about. Or what changes need to come there? There are lots of changes that need to come, and most particularly with other emerging markets, there are things that can work. For example, there are some rules that are made so as to have countries not get into this trouble. But once you are in trouble, it's a burden that's almost impossible to, to lift. Example, the surcharges the IMF uh, puts on debt. It makes perfect sense so as to prevent governments to get into debt. But once you are into debt, it's impossible to get out of it. So uh, there are, those are rules that need to be rethought. Um, at the same time, the, the global markets, I mean, ESG puts a lot of pressure on what can or cannot private uh, investors do. Um, that's one of the main reasons that Argentina is trying to play by the rules. We have to be good global citizens. And we are joining OECD. We have made a lot of decisions in that direction. But it will depend on using a lot of savings from other parts of the world, because Argentina has no savings of its own right now, uh, until that increases productivity. We invest it, increase productivity, and we grow. So it's going to be a, like a, it's a concept that it's kind of uh, uh, put together, everything should make sense. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Vera Songwe, let me turn to you now because you are thinking about one of the other huge uh, requirements, which is how to raise the enormous amount of capital that is needed to fund clim the climate transition in the emerging world. You've heard the Prime Minister and the Minister tell us about the sort of scale of defense spending that is going to be needed. Um, which, and uh, John Studinsky telling us that there is, needs to be sort of rethinking of public-private partnerships. How, how confident are you that you are gonna be able to raise the money needed for the climate transition? And what, I, do you think we need to be more um, innovative in that too, in the same way that we're beginning to think about being innovative in defense spending? Yeah, no, thank you. And maybe if I may just go back a little bit to defense spending because it's an important point particularly for Africa and for developing countries. I think about seven years ago, there was a huge debate at the IMF about what to do with defense spending and whether it was going to go below the line or, or, or above the line. And comes to mind Cote d'Ivoire, for example. And today we have the Sahel part of our continent, which is taken over essentially by rogue elements. 
and all the countries around the Sahel need to increase their defense spending to protect themselves. And there's a big question about what to do. So I'm very happy that there is some beginning of conversation about below the line and above the line, because defense spending today is an investment in growth in many of our countries, and I think Cote d'Ivoire has shown that. And so we must be able today, hopefully, to have a new conversation, even in uh, uh, emerging markets and in Africa in particular, about what we do about defense spending. And I think for a long time we had sort of talked about reducing defense spending. But in the environment where we live today, if you're in Mali, if you're in Niger, if you're in Burkina Faso, if you're in Sudan, if you're in, in many of these countries, defense spending, and if you're in Senegal and you need to protect yourself because you have a wall coming to you, you have to have some defense spending. And I think then the conversation becomes what kind of defense spending and can we be efficient at it? And, and a few years ago I had written an article, the only African country that actually produces any kind of defense material is South Africa, a little bit in Algeria. Is there a case also for some public-private partnerships where we begin to do more nimble drones and other innovative technologies that can, uh, can work around that? So that's defense spending. I think it is a global conversation today about how we do it, what we do, and especially how we measure it in the debt. Uh, a conversation. Now, coming to your question on climate, climate is another kind of war that we're waging and for which we need to build defenses. Um, today, about $8 trillion of the investment that is going to be needed to propel growth and deliver prosperity is in infrastructure, which is a core climate area, but it is also an area where the markets rate it more or less, you know, there's transition risk, there's physical risk, because you're going to have floods, you're going to have, and so the, 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 the sort of ratings that we get now to raise capital to do climate have become much more expensive. Capital for climate is expensive. There is no grant funding. And I think what we're talking about, including the middle income countries, is we must find some grant resources to be able to fund the climate change uh, uh, imperative. One trillion dollars is what we wrote in the Song Western report that is needed in external financing for emerging and uh, developing economies every year annually until 2030, of which a lot of it is going to go uh, into the energy transition. The question is how do we do the energy transition? Today we see a lot of conversation back into Africa because we need rare minerals. But the only way that we do what you're talking about, Minister and Prime Minister, is to use this as a new growth engine. We can talk about the debt problem on the continent, we can talk about the debt problem till kingdom come, if we are not growing, if we are not investing in industry, if we are not generating better productivity. And we have those tools today because there is no electric vehicle anywhere in the world, on any road in the world, that does not have a part from Africa. There is no cell phone, and we all have cell phones, 2,000 pieces of the cell phone that do not have a part from Africa. We do not have one industry on the continent producing any of those things. The only way that we generate growth, keep our youth on the continent, solve some of the migration problem that is putting pressure on your budget so that you cannot provide more grant financing, I think is really to worry about how we do better, more efficient, more effective investment. This goes through funding multilateral development agencies, giving them grant money, giving them guarantees so that institutional investors can actually, once we blend that risk, once we de-risk the capital that you can get investment in. May I chime in? Yes, briefly, and then I do want to open it to the floor. Okay, Sorry. actually, I'm in support of what she's saying. The way climate transition is being looked at is a very different developed market-centric uh, world. It's not only the question of the parts or where the minerals come, but why is it needed to operate in the same way that it is done on, on, on countries that have already grown as compared to what emerging markets might do? For example, Argentina or Uruguay or Paraguay, kind of Brazil, we have a very, very green uh, energy matrix. Why should we reduce it or why should we have the same kind of um, pressure to reduce the already low, very low carbon uh, print that we have? European, uh, African countries have very little yeah. carbon print. So how can they reduce something that's already very low? Yeah. In our case, we have, um, I'm talking now from Argentina, not, not necessarily the subcontinent, but um, we, we may be part of the solution for that kind of problems. Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay can be huge carbon sinks. So rather than put pressure 
on other, uh, on other countries that need to grow. Everybody needs to grow, everybody wants to grow. But uh, we can use the uh, potential that we have as carbon sinks. Mm -hmm. And carbon sinks done through agriculture, not necessarily forestry. That's the way also it was done in the Northern Hemisphere, but we have the possibility of having pastures that are far more efficient uh, and faster and cheaper than other kind of areas. So thinking of that way and putting it together might be a good idea. So again, a, a, a new way of thinking and more innovation. You want to make a quick point and then I must open to the floor. Um, uh, please allow me one remark since I'm finance minister. Uh, for <laughs> the capital markets, uh, it doesn't matter um, uh, for what uh, debt um, is uh, used. Debt is debt and they won't differentiate uh, whether the money is spent for oh, climate Basel action. Oh, Basel III does though, Basel III does. But not the capital markets. And then it, it, the it ES, percolates ES, onto, the, the, onto the, the credit ratings. If uh, the problem of indebtedness um, is a problem. And uh, so I think sound public finances and keeping fiscal buffers are key um, for, for the stability of our uh, economies. Um, I agree, uh, we need a, um, a structural reform of the multilateral banks and the uh, process is uh, ongoing. We want to expand the lending capacity through uh, blended finance solutions to mobilize private sector capital. But the low income and developing countries, they have own resources we can mobilize. And this is why we are in favor of um, uh, for the uh, compact with Africa mm -hmm. to improve the supp supply side um, <laughs> uh, uh, framework conditions of uh, those countries so that private sector money can be used for the development. And um, one remark uh, uh, to uh, your perspective, I think we should consider a global carbon market. Sure. You are, you are uh, right, yeah. it is extremely expensive to reduce our emissions in the highly developed countries. Right. With this money, or a, a little a part yes. of those spendings, mm -hmm. we can achieve much, much more, more yeah. for example, in okay. your case. Yep. That is the kind of big idea we should be discussing, but I do yep. want to make sure we open it up. And I first, for the first comment, I'd like to go to Wang Kui Yao, who is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Let's have a perspective from China. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny, for this excellent uh, round table, and uh, also Prime Minister, uh, Minister, and all the uh, distinguished guests. Well, I, I think the world is really uh, uh, have a lot of uh, concern now because we see the military budget has been rising <laughs> rapidly and, and, and see we, the development uh, uh, budget is, is coming down, particularly also we need to uh, combat this uh, cl climate crisis as well. So, so what, I, what I would like to, to suggest actually from, from a Chinese perspective, we, for, for example, in China, China launched this Belt and Road Initiative for the last uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ten, uh, 10 years, and then they invest over one trillion, <coughs> uh, about 3,000 projects uh, for, the, for, the, for the Global South. So, so that, that probably is uh, one good example. And then that has actually aroused a lot of uh, uh, corresponding interest. And now we see, uh, you know, U.S. put forward the Build Back Better World, PCW, and EU put forward uh, go, EU Global Gateway. And, and at G20, we had this uh, uh, also uh, Indian uh, Middle East Europe corridor. So. Why can't we get those uh, uh, different uh, infrastructure development initiatives work together? Because I think because we're lacking the trust, and then we, we, are, we are getting a lot of geopolitical uh, compete, and then uh, you know, even po possible hot, you know, we're having hot war already, then, and that's really the, the big uh, 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 obstacles for the future. So I think we have to probably uh, build up the trust and then build up the development. So I, I could come propose, we talk about the German finance, finance minister talk about development uh, and banks, why can't we World Bank, AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, like uh, uh, a, 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 a Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, and Intermarket Development Bank, all those Development Bank works together. They, they are working on the same charter. You know, AIB was modeled at the World Bank, and then we can work together. And also for a big chunk of, uh, of the screen development, which China already uh, uh, did on that infrastructure, China has two thirds of global uh, 5G networks, two thirds of a global speed railway, and the other 10 largest uh, uh, ports in, in the world, ten of, uh, seven of them are in China. So that can also the clean technology and that can be shared and can be worked together with all the development banks and with all the in international initiatives. So, so I really think that we, 
we have to drive up the development budget, a green uh, uh, budget, rather than we drive up the military budget, which is the, the wrong way to go. So the fundamental is that we have to really get attention to this important discussion. I think Zan is <laughs> doing great uh, uh, moderating, and we have to work together. That would be my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you certainly you, you put it, no, I, no one could have put it better. How do you do this in an environment of no trust? Um, uh, I, I, I think probably leaderships in both your country and the United States would be a place to start. Um, but <laughs> let me open up to questions now. Lady there on the second row. Comments, questions. Yes. Hi. So this is Hinar Banikar, former minister from Pakistan. Um, and uh, I will warn, I just want to be slightly provocative and to just say, at the very outset, that do you not think that most of this conversation is being very tactical rather than strategic? And perhaps the most innovative, efficient, safe way to ensure that we have our budgets uh, looking after the needs of the people, whether it's in climate change or in SDGs, still not a forgotten topic, is by finding innovative ways of making sure that we don't need to spend more on defense. So coming from a region where we were all told that we spend too much on defense, I find it rather novel when we are sitting here in rooms like this talking about how can we and how should we spend more on defense. And we know from our own history of the world and each one of them, so this is not pointing fingers at the West or the, e the world, the world together, that we do find the money to spend on war in Afghanistan but never find money to rebuild Afghanistan, etc. We, we have a long history of that. So I think we're getting a bit too overwhelmed by why is conflict everywhere? Maybe there's something we are missing everywhere. Why is conflict increasing everywhere? Because I think increasingly uh, the demand to find solutions, to find ways to make peace is becoming less and less. We're all becoming combative, aggressive, and feel the need is to find, to spend on defense. So I'm just gonna end in this and just to say that as a country which has struggled with finding enough financing to be able to feed its people and find, I find it rather interesting that we will, the international system, for instance, will find ways of making sure that defense spending is not considered to be, or within the European Union context, considered to be part of deficit. We've never been able to do that mm -hmm. for climate financing. We've never been able to do that for SDGs. So I really want to take a long, hard, deep look into are we being very tactical and are we missing the big picture? Uh, I think that's a very interesting and, and provocative comment to start with. Um, when you sit in Europe right now with a large land war on the eastern border, it does uh, feel that you have the world as you have rather than the world as you would like. Um, but Prime Minister. Yep. I was thinking as I was um, uh, listening to, uh, to your comment about you know, our, our particular um, uh, context. Um, uh, and again, we've had our own geopolitical challenges uh, uh, facing uh, an aggressive uh, neighbor to our east, and we always felt, and we continue to do so, that we need to spend enough to have a credible deterrence. However, we are certainly trying to reach out to Turkey to establish normal and better relations. And in the long term, because this is a long-term process, yes, this at some point could lead to a more permanent detente that would force us to slightly, but I stress the word, slightly rethink the way we allocate funds uh, to our defense uh, industry. But I think when you are in, in very complicated sort of geopolitical positions, I mean, uh, the risk of being too naive uh, in, in terms of your long-term planning um, can actually um, lead you in, you know, within a few years to find yourself in, in a very, very uh, compromised position. So I think we, so we all, you know, um, uh, strive um, uh, for peace, but uh, at some point, uh, you know, there's also this well-known axiom that if you want peace, you know, prepare for, for war. And I think that the, the mindset right now uh, in, in Europe is, is very much uh, along, um, uh, along those lines because we just cannot uh, underestimate the trauma of a, a war uh, in the European heartland, something which was completely inconceivable. Um, uh, three, four years ago, and certainly to a generation which grew up, you know, after the collapse of the Berlin uh, uh, um, uh, War and uh, went through the 90s and the 2000s, you know, with this sort of optimism that uh, the dark continent had left its darkness sort of behind it. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a shock uh, and a very rude uh, um, wake-up call. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, gentleman at the back there. Hello, I am from Ukraine, uh, Telegraph uh, UA, uh, Yaroslav Zharino, my name. The minister said uh, that it is first time when Germany uh, will spend uh, over 2% uh, uh, GDP uh, for the uh, defense. Uh, it is uh, really uh, important news for us and uh, for European uh, Union and also for German leadership. But uh, now Russia spent uh, also more than 7% of uh, GDP or near uh, 40 uh, percent of uh, budget for the war and for their, how they call, defense. And uh, uh, my question, it is uh, uh, to you, how do you think it, uh, may, if it would be uh, too late to invest more when Russia uh, using this rising uh, defense budget and rising defense uh, uh, complex uh, will have uh, some better results in Ukraine and uh, they become stronger. If it will be too late for European Union you. and uh, for uh, Europe uh, in general. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. Minister Lindner, I think that's one for you. Well, uh, we are working together as Europeans to support Ukraine and to secure um, our uh, interests and um, so you should not compare Russia with Germany but you have to compare uh, Russia with uh, NATO and the European Union and so um, our um, capabilities uh, are limited we have uh, fiscal constraints we are concentrating on strengthening our Bundeswehr and um, on uh, supporting Ukraine and uh, as you uh, probably are aware of, uh, Germany has supported Ukraine by uh, 28 billion euros uh, by now. And even us, we have fiscal limits. Can I, can I add to that one quick thing? Uh, actually, why don't you go there? No, I just wanted to come in quickly with two, with two responses. One, it is clear, and so many pieces of work have been done, including by the World Bank, that show that for every dollar that we spend on peace, we spend $16 on war. So the investment in peace needs to increase and we're not investing in peace. And, and essentially we have a couple of multilateral institutions that do the investment in peace. It's again the MDBs, it's the G20, and it's the UN Security Council. And the question is, are we investing in those institutions enough to build trust so that we don't have to spend the $16 on that? And finally, I, I want to say this before, uh, because the minister talked about carbon markets. Carbon markets is the only way that emerging markets raise the trillion dollars for the climate uh, uh, crisis. But we need for the developed world to make sure that it becomes compliant. Yeah. And we need a compliance yeah. process. This voluntary process does not work for us. And so if you could be the champion, I think this would be the big idea that comes out of this. If Germany starts with compliance markets on carbon, the carbon sinks that you have in us, we will no longer be in debt. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. I have time for one more question. Yes, gentleman up there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a journalist uh, from uh, China, CGTN. I have a question about, uh, there's an uh, interesting uh, theme from the report pub published by Munich Security Conference that is you know, how to lo avoid lose-lose situation. I guess it refers to during the process of de-risking, a softer term for decoupling from, for example, with China, you know, how can European countries, how can the United States, you know, uh, shall we set a bottom line, how far we will go uh, before all will suffer? And we used to talk about a win-win, you know, everybody wins from cooperation, but now we are talking more about de-risking, for example, scrutiny uh, of Chinese investment in this part or investment out to China. Uh, I want your response on that. Thank you. I think, uh, Prime Minister, this is one for you. How far has, has de-risking gone too far? How much further does it need to go? And are we heading for a lose-lose world? Greece is not a G7 or a G20 country, so it does not participate in, uh, in those gatherings where the you know, very, very important decisions are taking place. But I, I would like to come back to the point that you uh, raised before regarding you know, fundamental trust and the ability at some point to distinguish between those areas where we have to work together and those areas where it's only natural for us to be um, strategic um, um, competitors. Uh, what I do know 
is that when these issues become very politicized and become part of the, of the domestic debate, <laughs> then usually we don't take the, more, the most rational um, uh, decisions. Uh, and that's why it's you know, good to come to these sort of gatherings because uh, I think it, it puts things uh, into, into a much uh, a clearer perspective and it is also a, a great opportunity for us. Um, uh, to, to talk to our counterparts um, uh, from uh, from China to understand, uh, you know, how we can find this, uh, you know, admittedly very complicated balance. Thank you. I think global cooperation is in our mutual interest, and the fragmentation of the global economy is a real threat for prosperity. But um, tension, regional uh, tension, um, leads uh, to um, problems in, in our supply chains. Mm -hmm. So if one country can avoid geopolitical tension, the, the, the need for de-risking of supply chains would decrease. And so we all should consider this, including Beijing. Thank you. John. Yeah, I, I'd like to leave on a positive note. I, I want to remind, it's not too far long ago um, to the Prime Minister's point about uh, things becoming too politicized. Um, a number of people in this room were involved heavily in the details of the global financial crisis in 2008. And w then I was working on the restructuring of AIG. But every Monday, the, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the PBOC, the Bank of England, they all talked for a couple of hours. And there was day-to-day -day communication on managing all the markets, the volatility, the counterparty risk, and the world was very much in lockstep. And we need to think about what are the lessons learned in that period where politics was put aside and we had a common problem to solve. We sort of forgot that in COVID. COVID went off the rails in terms of global coordination. And I think we need to go back to those lessons learned because people talking regularly and engagement, it did, it was a world of difference in 2008. It really was. And that was this, really the core of why the problems were rectified on a relatively short time frame. I think that's right. And I'm now going to pick on you as the only person, at least with an American accent in this room. But one of the challenges now is that we have, you know, uh, former President Trump making announcements which led in part to your piece in the Frankfurter Allgemeine, uh, you know, threatening that, you know, a, a country that didn't pay up uh, would be, he would, he would tell them that, you know, Russia should do what they like with them. So, yes, you're right, we need to talk more, but presumably also you need to have uh, governments that are committed on both sides to the international system. Or maybe it was because it's the financial systems and everybody wants to protect financial systems. The rest of the, the people don't care. Well, as I said, Manny, we're living now in a new age of authoritarian personalities. Uh, and I think we have to come to grips to how that's challenging the perception of liberal democracy. Well, that's a very sober place to end on, but it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> I apologize for that. We should have ended up somewhere upbeat. But we did actually, you had some, some big ideas focus on growth, I think absolutely. It's big ideas, new innovation. I think this is not a bad place to set up uh, for the first opening panel. So thank you all. Thank you for a great panel. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.